Encampments for those without housing became more widespread and visible in many parts of Ontario over the course of the pandemic. Municipalities have approached that in various ways. In Waterloo recently, a court ruling against the region on whether it could clear an encampment set precedent that could ripple across the province. With us now to explain, Seema Atri. She is a human rights and constitutional lawyer at the Community Justice Collective. And we're grateful to have you with us tonight here on TVO. Can you tell me just off the top, the Community Justice Collective is what? Uh, we're, we provide free legal support for uh, communities who are organizing around different political issues. We've done a lot of work with people in encampments. Okay, tell us whether a municipality actually needs a court order to begin with in order to break up an encampment. Sure. Before I answer your question, let me give you a little bit of context okay. around why people are ending up in encampments um, in cities across Ontario and what it actually looks like to be in those encampments. Mm -hmm. I want to share that first, there's no housing available for people right now, and that's why people are ending up outside. That's the point the judge made in his decision. That's exactly that the point. There's, if there's no space available or exactly. accessible, then you can't break up an encampment. Exactly. So John Tory will speak a lot about how there's support services for people to enter housing, but that housing just doesn't exist. There's also just no safe shelter option. So even if people can end up in shelters, those shelters are often very dangerous and are leading people to either choose not to go for their own safety or just not be able to access those shelter spots in the first place. And then people end up outside in the encampments where they face constant harassment by police and bylaw officers. Honestly, there's just nowhere to exist right now for people who are unhoused in cities across Ontario. You're kicked out of the parks, you're kicked out of buses, you're kicked out of shelters. And many of these actions are violating people's rights, so we end up in court. Okay, if you're going to put that on the record, i got to push back a little bit and say, mm -hmm. you know, from the point of view of others, and look, no one wants to live in these yeah. kinds of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Let's put that on the record right away. But from the point of view of other citizens, it sure looks like these encampments are allowed to exist a lot longer than, than makes sense for public safety all around. Is that not fair to say? I'd push back and say, where, where do people want people to live? If there is an indoor shelter space and there aren't affordable housing options for people, people are forced to live outside. They aren't making this choice. They're, this is, at this point, the safest option for people. And so if we want to address this, we need to actually address the problem of housing and the lack of indoor housing, which that, is what, what I think this court is sure. trying that's, to do. For sure. That's the long-term solution here, obviously. Mm -hmm. But in the short term, let's go back to my first yeah. question. Does a municipality need a court order in order to bust up an encampment? So no, a municipality does not need a court order to just simply enforce its own rules on public property. And that's what Waterloo said it was doing in this case. That is, but I would say that people also have rights. So cities' powers are not limitless. People do have charter rights, and cities have to respect those charter rights, and that's how we keep ending back up in court. But cities do not need a court order. They could just choose to enforce these evictions on their own. They have faced a lot of pushback, though, Steve, over the last few years when they have tried to break up the encampments. So I would offer that likely Waterloo went to court to try to get a stamp from a court allowing them to um, enforce an encampment eviction. Well, that was going to be my next question, because mm -hmm. if, you, if you don't need to go to court mm -hmm. to bust up an encampment, why bother going? Why did they go? Exactly. They're facing, cities are facing a lot of pushback when they're violently clearing encampments. We saw mass protests in Toronto when John Tory tried to clear the encampments in 2021. And so cities are going to courts to get a stamp of approval, but we saw that backfire in the case of uh, the region of Waterloo, where not only did the court deny the city the ability to uh, enforce that encampment clearing, but in fact has told the region they can't enforce any encampment clearing until they, addre they address the lack of of housing um, in the region. And now this case precedent applies across the province. Waterloo region's contention here mm -hmm. was that the people in the encampment on, I guess it was Victoria Street that mm -hmm. we're talking about here, that those folks were violating probably eight different municipal bylaws, mm -hmm. which gave them the political cover to make the moves that they did. Mm -hmm. Do you dispute that the, the encampment was in violation of eight different bylaws? In many ways in the region of Waterloo, that question is irrelevant because the court has found that it's unconstitutional to enforce those bylaws. I would ask if, if you or your viewers have ever tried to look through the lengthy bylaws that exist around the regulation of public, of how you can use public property. There's rules around what times you can be in parks. There's rules around many permitting, that many, many permits that are required for noise or gatherings or events. And I would say many of us have probably violated many of these bylaws on public land because bylaws are not always enforced when they're being violated. 
The exception to this is if you're unhoused. When you're unhoused, I've been in encampments and in parks where you see police come every single hour to harass and to enforce bylaws against people who really have nowhere else to go. Mm -hmm. And so, and these bylaws are being used as an excuse to search people's tents, to take people's belongings, potentially to arrest them and evict them from the encampment. But the legal reality is that you don't need to enforce a bylaw and you don't need to enforce it in that way, even if the bylaw exists. And so I would push back and say that although a bylaw might exist and might be being breached, the city doesn't need to be enforcing them in this way. And also people have rights mm -hmm. and the enforcement of those bylaws need to be balanced right. with those rights. I like when you push back incidentally. Uh, that makes mm -hmm. for a sparkier conversation, mm -hmm. so that's good. The region of Waterloo said it's costing them and their municipal ratepayers mm. $80,000 a month to deal with this problem. Mm -hmm. Does that sound legit to you? Yeah, I read the decision. The majority of the 80000 is going for the cost of security personnel. And there was um, a big outcry in Toronto when Toronto sought a $1 million contract for security personnel. And I would, I would urge viewers to understand that security are not there for the um, safety of encampment residents. They're often being ordered by cities not to intervene in encampments, but simply to stand on the barriers to try to deter people from living in encampments. So I would say, why spend public resources in this hmm. way? Now, you said a little bit earlier that you think this decision, and you're not the only mm -hmm. one to have said it, will have ripples across the province of Ontario for other people in mm -hmm. other encampments in other municipalities. Mm -hmm. Do we know, in fact, that that's the case and that this is not just a one-off for Waterloo? Well, we know that this law now applies across the province. Um, and we now have a court decision in Ontario that says that people have a constitutional right to shelter outside if cities do not have um, available and, and accessible. accessible indoor housing right. options. Because Kingston's about to go through this too, mm -hmm. right? Kingston is a plan. I've got a statement here from the mayor, which I'm going to read in a second. They're planning mm -hmm. to evict about 70 people yeah. who are living in an encampment on Montreal Street in Kingston, mm -hmm. supposedly to take place next March. Mm -hmm. uh, let's do this. Sheldon, shall we here? Top of page two, the quote from uh, the mayor. In an emailed statement to CBC News, Kingston Mayor Brian Patterson said, there are also some key differences to consider between the encampment situation in Waterloo region and the situation here in Kingston. The Waterloo ruling refers to an encampment site on a parking lot, mm -hmm. while Kingston's is on public land and subject to different bylaws. Mayor Patterson adding the ruling, quote, appears to impose a substantial new responsibility on municipalities without providing any of the necessary resources. Mm -hmm. Does he have a point when he says, public land versus parking lot makes this a different story. And first, I'd respectfully disagree with Mayor Patterson that there's a new responsibility put on cities. People had these rights before this encampment, before this ruling from the Waterloo decision, and this court was simply recognizing those rights that already existed. Um, but I, I think it's true that there is a difference. This is a different factor to examine, um, whether it's a vacant parking lot or a public park. But the decision in Waterloo does not say that the decision only applies to vacant public land. It simply uses that as a factor. And I think to understand how courts will evaluate this, we need to understand how charter protections are um, balanced by our courts in Ontario. And so what we hear from Justice Valente is that people do have this Section the, 7 rights. the judge in the Waterloo case. Yes, exactly. Who wrote Sorry. the decision for Sorry. the Waterloo case. Yes, so, just, so the judge in that case says that people clearly have Section 7 rights to live outside because it is the safest way for them to live. It is the only way to live with dignity um, by erecting a shelter and that clearing people from an encampment will put them in more harm's way. So people have those rights, whether they're on public property, which is in a park, or on public property in a vacant parking lot. But the balancing question is how to balance that with other government objectives and other people's rights. Yes. I think what we saw um, in Toronto is that there are ways for encampments to uh, live in, um, live within other, live so that people are, other, are also able to use that public space. Mm -hmm. Um, and in fact, what we saw as people were coming out to defend evictions, that it was many neighbors in the neighborhoods who were coming out to support okay, people. Okay, can I pick up on that? I, that's a key point to me because, I mean, let's face it, this is all now in the, in the realm of politics. Mm -hmm. if, if you had a couple of tents here mm -hmm. and a couple of tents there yeah. and a couple of tents on the other side of town mm -hmm. so that it was more spread out rather than having everybody in one encampment in one place mm -hmm. as both... Never mind that it's an eyesore. I mean, dangerous for, for the people living there, dangerous yeah. for the local residents as well. Do you think this would be less politically problematic and therefore we probably wouldn't be talking about it today? 
I, I'm wondering why you think it's more dangerous for people to live in large encampments versus be isolated, often by themselves. Well, because the police are coming the after public them. eye. Okay, exactly. So it's dangerous because they're being because clearings are being enforced, because police are being sent in instead of support services. Because the reason people are living together, when I speak with encampment residents, is that there's a lot of safety to living collectively. It also allows support services to be centralized. It allows people to stay in one place to be able to continue, hopefully on a pathway towards housing. There's no safety living collectively if the police are gonna be in there at the, at the behest of you know, politicians and bylaw enforcement officers and so on to break up the encampments. There's no safety there. But the fact is police are breaking up uh, people's tents even when they're living one by one. So there's people living alone in ravines who are being evicted is from true? their tents. It is true. Okay. It is I, true. I don't hear much about that. I hear much about this. I don't hear much about that. I mean, I can tell you the story. The week before the Waterloo um, encampment clearing happened, I got a call from three encampment residents who were being evicted from a corner from Simcoe and Richmond in downtown Toronto. They were being, uh, the police came in to evict them from their encampment. They said that they did have housing and an emergency shelter option if they left the corner. The city tweeted out that they were giving housing to people in order to remove them. A uh, bulldozer came in, uh, it destroyed all of people's belongings. They walked to the shelter, the shelter did not have space for them. They stayed there all day outside of the shelter and the shelter never had room. That's the reality of what this homelessness approach looks like in a city like Toronto and cities like Waterloo. And it's happening whether you're in a large encampment or just a few tents on a corner. I, I know I have been told by city officials in the past that there are spaces available, mm -hmm. that people often prefer to live in encampments, even on a cold night outdoors, as opposed to in a city shelter because shelters can be violent, mm -hmm. they can be uncertain, you can get your stuff stolen, all of that yeah. kind of thing. Do you think those statements are accurate? Do you think there actually is shelter space available? It's just that people don't necessarily want to avail themselves of it? No, even the city's own data right now is saying that there's a thousand less uh, shelter spots for the 10,000 people who are currently living outside in Toronto. We also have a lot of investigative reporting that's showing that in, the, in December, for example, um, CBC reported that 100 people are turned away every single night from Toronto shelters. So there, there isn't sufficient shelter. I think it's also important to understand the level of violence in the shelters that's leading people to feel safer on a night where it's negative 30 outside, living outside on the street. There's been a tripling in violence in Toronto shelters. Um, people talk about rampant um, abuse and people often are coming from traumatic and abusive situations entering shelter s spaces that are then very violent. It's, there's also a problem where people sometimes are given one night in a shelter but told that they have to leave all of their belongings to get that one night in the shelter. So they'll have to give up their tent, give up all of their other personal belongings that they're using to survive yeah. for a night that they'll then get kicked right back out at 6 a.m. Mm. Bigger shelters may not be the solution. What's the solution in your view? I, I wouldn't agree that bigger shelters aren't the solution. I think the issue is emergency shelters, where you just have one night in a shelter, is not a solution for people who are living outside and made to give up everything. So I think people have spoken to me about the fact that the hotel shelter program in Toronto, where people were given their own locked rooms, they had a level of privacy, they were given some support services, we and given that some... Though, haven't we? So the city, that's the problem. The city's yeah. trying to cut back on those, um, and definitely not building more, which is what we would need. The, the other obvious um, solution to the problem is actually addressing our lack of affordable housing crisis that doesn't just exist in Toronto, it exists across the province. And it's happening both because our governments are spending less and less money building public housing, but also because of the rampant commercialization of our rental housing so that even tenants can't afford to live in our cities. That's Seema Atri. She is co-director of the Community Justice Collective, and we thank you for coming into TVO tonight and putting this on our radar screen. Thanks so much. Thank you, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.